Welcome, everyone. I'd like to um, welcome Cahal McDade. He is an expert uh, on core mobility network signaling security. So he knows everything about the SS7 network interconnect standard. And his recent achievements include the discovery of the SIMJack vulnerability. And that was not the one where you just uh, call your phone company and say, hey, I lost my SIM card. Please send me a new one. But it was or it is an attack which runs in the background like a silent SMS taking over your account for a short period of time. He works for years and almost decades in the field of telecommunications, messaging and security, and is also often um, a contributor or a guest on different worldwide information. So we will switch over um, to Ireland in a moment to hear things about how surveillance companies attack mobile networks, not only in Europe, but in many different parts of the world, for example, in the area of South America. And they try to track the location of mobile phone users and also taking um, different um, measures to use the phone for a certain amount of time. And um, within this talk, we are up to analyzing the data being used. Enjoy the talk and see you for the questions, Q and questions and answer in the follow up. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the presentation, Watching the Watchers, how surveillance companies track you using mobile networks. My name is Colin McDade. I am CTO of Adaptive Mobile Security. And what we do is we help mobile operators around the world defend their telecom networks. Today, I'll be taking you through the world of mobile surveillance companies, as seen from our experience in detecting and blocking them. I'll be explaining what they do, how they do it, how they've changed over time, and what we can expect for them in the future, along with plenty of examples. And interestingly, this is actually quite a topical subject at the moment. Surveillance companies are often in the news, but these three headlines are all from this month, December, with, uh, which all covered roughly the same area about how surveillance companies are using mobile networks. And there have been many other headlines in the previous months and years for the last few years. But before I jump into the details of these surveillance companies, it's worth remembering how we got here in the first place and why we are discussing this. Today, almost every network around the world uses 2G or the 3G network uh, protocols. And what this and how these networks work is they use a protocol called Signaling System 7 or SS7. This is the backbone network which allows mobile operators to communicate within their network and between mobile networks. And what allows you to roam when we used to roam, send text messages abroad, make phone calls, be connected, and so on. And as you are probably, many of you are aware, there's been a lot of reports of security incidents with this over the last couple of years. And these all stem from one key assumption in development of the SS7 network. It's simply that it assumes trust between every mobile phone operator around the world. The network was designed at a time when everybody assumed that only those who have access should have access, simply a trust model. And as it turns out, this hasn't been the case as there has been some connections which have abused this trust. Interestingly enough, the protocol which has replaced the 2G and 3G network in many places, the 4G network, also suffers from the same protocol. This protocol, or same problem. This protocol is called diameter and the same trust issue exists in that it also assumes that everybody who is connected um, should have access and will not do anything malicious. So this is one small key takeaway. Often it's described that the problem with the mobile phone networks is its age, that because it was developed in the 70s or 80s or 90s, it wasn't designed with security. Well, a protocol designed in the 2010s also has the same problem. In fact, it's even slightly worse. So the problem itself isn't so much the technology, it's just the trust and the security assumptions in building the technology at the time. So... Keeping in mind the security implications, we can now look to see who is actually exploiting 
this trust model? Well, we see three main types of ex exposures. One, the surveillance companies who are speaking about rotation. Second, governments. Um, here is a screenshot from a report from the Ukrainian regulator. This is from 2014 and was one of the key events in pushing the development of signaling security. This is a report that they issued concerning um, attacks or malicious activity, which they observed coming in to their networks from what they believe were Russian sources in 2014. And finally, of course, on, and not unexpectedly, criminals. Criminals we've also seen exploiting these networks. There is some overlap between surveillance companies and governments, as you might expect. Governments are often the customers. They want to buy this equipment from the surveillance companies, but sometimes governments may try to build this technology themselves rather than rely on surveillance companies. And when they do, they often use some of the same sources as in entry points as surveillance companies. We also see also small overlap between criminal activity and surveillance companies. Again, they, sometimes there's an overlap in the sources and how they gain access to these networks. One important thing about surveillance companies to keep in mind is they have very large resources. They get paid a lot for what they do. And these large resources translates into complex attacks and quite sophisticated technologies. And we'll see this as I go in more details about how attacks are executed. So attacks and how they execute is a very interesting point because it's not always apparent exactly what is an attack over these signaling networks. First thing to keep in mind, though, is that the industry is very different from 2014. Um, from 2014, we in the industry have been recommending ways for mobile operators to protect subscribers and their networks. And the key outputs of this is a series of recommendations or standards or documents, if you will. For the 2G and 3G network, which is S7, the key document is a document called FS11. And for the 4G network, which is a protocol called Diameter, the key output is a document called FS19. And so what the operators do around the world is they take this information and then they work with mobile security companies like ourselves or other vendors to put in place protection and, gate and um, firewalls and defenses based on these recommendations. One particular thing to keep in mind though, is that this is just a starting block. So when they apply in these recommendations, they find that a vast, vast majority of traffic, S7 traffic in this case, is completely normal. But there's a very small percentage, in this case 0.04%, which we see, which is irregular or suspicious. Very important thing to keep in mind though, is irregular or suspicious does not necessarily equal malicious. When you actually look at this, 0.04% traffic, the vast, vast majority of it is just noise. It's misconfigured uh, nodes around the world, uh, local specific configurations, and so on. The vast majority is not actually malicious. When you investigate this in detail, as you we believe you have to do, you find then a very small percentage of that 0.04%, 1.37% is actually malicious. And this is an important point. Not everything which you, an operator may block may actually be regarded as malicious. A lot of it just noise which they are blocking primarily to be safe and to be certain. And it can take a lot of experience. Uh, it takes a lot of analysis to determine what is malicious versus what is simply irregular. And it can be quite easy to make mistakes. If you sometimes you read headlines of huge attacks using um, SS7 Diameter Network, many cases what's happened here is that um, the, the person analyzing may have regarded all this type of traffic malicious, but that isn't the case. It's simply irregular. In this report, in this presentation, we have fo focused primarily and in fact exclusively on what we regard as malicious types of traffic. So looking at the traffic itself, let's look to see who generates this. So one question is, obvious question, what do mobile surveillance companies do? Well, in our experience, is, can you guess is surveillance? And it primarily breaks into two main areas. When it comes to SS7, mobile surveillance companies spend 60, about most of their activity, 60% of their activity, harvesting information. And then roughly about half that again, spend about 30% doing the actual tracking. And I'll show you how that ratio often shows up in real life attacks soon. They also spend a certain amount of time as well doing um, testing, as well as that, they spend a small percentage of time doing actually interception of calls and, and text messages. You may expect that to be larger, but that is the next case. The vast majority of time, surveillance companies are doing tracking or they're doing information harvesting. And the reason for the information harvesting is simply to help their location tracking. This is, as I mentioned, SS7 activity, which is the 3G 
uh, slash 2G network, but for the 4G network, they also use this protocol called Diameter. I haven't shown that in these stats here. Their malicious activity over diameter has been quite small in the past, but we have seen a large increase in it recently. And for one particular surveillance company, we do see also SS7 activity, or sorry, SMS activity, and I'll go into more detail about that soon. So how, lo how is location tracking done via SS7? Well, first of all, if you want to get more public background information, I really recommend you go to, to take a look at two excellent presentations from an earlier edition of this Chaos Computing Club 31C, and that's from Carson Nall and Tobias Engels, Engel, and they give a very good overview of how these attacks are executed. But from a high level, there's two different ways of doing this. A direct method, where an attacker will query a node called the HLR. The attacker will send in a phone number, which is a MISN, and get back a cell ID. Or an indirect method, where the attacker will first use the phone number to get some background information, in this case, the IMSI and an MSC, and then use this information to query a node deeper in the network directly to get back the same information, the cell ID. These two parts of these attacks, the first part of the main part of method one and the second part of method two are the location tracking part. But this part beforehand in method two is called the information harvesting. Now you may ask, why does an attacker do this at all? Why should they use method two when method one is more direct? Well, this is because things change. Mobile operators are putting in defenses and now it's a lot harder to do method one. Surveillance companies have essentially a toolbox of commands that they can use. Then there's three main commands that they can use in the SS7 network, ATI, PSI, and PSL, which stand for the information in the table here. And from their perspective, they have pros and cons in using each of these commands. And their primary pros and cons and decision-making point is often down to what's, what will work in the operator that they are targeting. And this is mainly based on what defenses the operator has. So to show this uh, di diagrammatically, we can show this graph here. And here I've plotted out on the axis is two main pieces of information. In the bottom axis is the possibility of this attack to be blocked. And on the uh, left axis, the vertical axis, the amount of information that an attacker needs to have to be successful. And you can see these three previous commands be spread out like this. This is the, it shows the amount of information which an attacker might need on the left, and like I said, on the bottom, the possibility of the attacker to be blocked. Where an attacker really wants to be is in the bottom left segment, because here it's more likely that their attack will be successful or less likely to be blocked, and they need to get less information. So we can see that the ATI there, the possibility of it, if it being blocked is quite high, but the amount of information that the attacker needs is quite low, it just needs a phone number. Whereas the PSI in the top left, the amount of information attacker needs is high. It needs phone number and more details, um, but the possibility of the attacker to be blocked is less again. So you can see there's a distribution and there are choices to be made by an attacker. I'll show those choices and how a real life attack actually occurs. Here is a real life attack from March uh, 2018. In this particular case, there are several stages of the attack. First of all, there's an information harvesting part of it. Um, this point in time, we've seen we saw two attacks, two packets come in from two sources in the UK Channel Islands. These are two operators, Sure Guernsey and Jersey Airtel, and these are use this command called SRISM. This is a standard information harvesting type uh, method. Then there was another information harvesting using two different other types of packets. These confusingly look very similar, but they do slightly different things. Again, from the same sources. And then we saw a third series of information harvesting. Again, two SRISMs from the United Kingdom, but one also packet as well from Cameroon. And then finally, at this point, we saw the actual location tracking attack. Here we see four ATIs, one from Jersey Airtel, and then one from Cameroon, Israel now. It's important to note in this particular case that all these attacks were actually blocked by the operator, so no information was retrieved. And the ATIs at the awards the end was more an element of desperation from the attacker. Also, this is all within a five minute period. So you can see the, the sequence of attacks is, is relatively quick between all five. In this particular case, the attacker was in quite uh, a hurry. 
has wives in a hurry and the actual target, well, this is actually what occurred. Um, we subsequently learned that the targeted mobile number was associated with this person, uh, Hervé Jobet, who was a French formal naval officer and marine engineer. And the aim, we believe, of the attack was to see if the number existed and if so, its location. This is a video of the Nostromo, a boat which was being believed this person was on at the time. And there was quite a bit of discussion about on the events, geopolitical events around this case in this article. And for more details, I encourage you to go to the link to get the complete story of what has actually occurred around this time. So that is the SS7 network. But now let's look at to see how it happens in other networks, particularly the 4G network, which uses the diameter protocol. This is very, very similar. Again, there can be a direct method, in which case the attacker can use a command called UDR, and then they can re retrieve from the HSS a cell ID, or an indirect method. And in this case, there's nothing to stop the attacker using an earlier packet from an earlier protocol, in this case, SS7, to get the information, because this is simply the information harvesting part of the phase. So assuming that they do this, they harvest information using this command at the time, they then use this information using an IDR command and then retrieve the cell ID from the network targeted network. Again, two methods. Location tracking is the key part to receive information, but information harvesting is really the prerequisite piece of information that needs to happen when the, attack, when the target's network starts putting in protection. So again, there's a toolbox of commands that the subscriber can use. And as you can guess, each one of these commands also has pros and cons on whether it can be um, used successfully or not. So to show that again visually with the same graph, and I'll recreate again the three commands which we saw earlier for SS7. If I plot these three diameter commands, we can actually see that they occupy some of the same or similar positions as the SS7 commands. The two in the bottom right, PLR, UDR. These are the type of attacks that a, an attacker would want to use in an ideal world because they require less information. But these are much more likely that an operator will successfully block from the start. So in many cases, what the attacker ends up having to use is a command called an IDR, which is in the top left. They need a lot more information for this to be successful, but it's harder for, uh, for an operator to actually block this. So what these look like in real life. So this is a real IDR command, which we saw actually just a few weeks ago. And in this particular case, the command is insert subscriber data, IDR. And where this is coming from, just to keep the team going, this is actually originated from a network. This originated from Jersey Airtrail network again. And the destination of this is a, first of all, a subscriber, a username, and a destination network somewhere in this region. This is G in mobile country code geographic region five is Asia Pacific region. And in this particular case, they're requesting the current location. So there is no reason why a network in the channel islands should be requesting the cell ID of a subscriber who is in one of these networks. But this is what we actually see in this case. And this is a location tracking request over diameter. Um, I'm showing again the, the channel islands, but there's multiple networks for sources of these attacks, which can happen as we see over diameter. So one important thing to know is that I've shown you 3G and I've shown you 4G, but this Surveillance companies don't necessarily think in the world that way. They see mobile technology as the tool, not as a patch. So to recap, a surveillance company, they want to target their targets, obviously. So what we've seen over time is that they can execute SS7 attacks using the 3G protocol. What can happen then is the mobile operator will start putting in place protection um, and build puts in firewalls to prevent these actual types of attacks. 
then over time, the surveillance company might switch to 4G to use the diameter protocol. And again, what will happen eventually is the mobile operator will put in place defenses to block these types of attacks. So what you might expect in the future then is maybe that the um, surveillance company might use variants of these attacks, different ways of doing it, or eventually might use to move to the 5G protocol. And again, our mobile operator will put in place um, firewalls and we just got a protective wall to protect us. Now, it would be brilliant if the world worked like this, but surveillance companies don't think in a linear path. From their perspective, all they care about is the target. They don't care what technology they use and they are not beholden to development plans and technology schedules. They just want to get information on the target. So in this particular case, what happens if they can get sources of their attacks within the network, then that becomes a very valuable thing for, thing for them to aim for and a very valuable uh, tool for them to use. And this is what we've seen with this next type of attack, which we've seen the attackers use. This is an attack we call Simjacker. And this is why it's so valuable in that it allowed them to essentially bypass the plans and the, the thought processes of the industry in defending against surveillance companies using mobile technologies. So to step back a moment, what exactly is Simjacker? Um, it's essentially a vulnerability, which we reported last year, 2019. And what it is, is uses a vulnerability in a SIM card library. And the SIM card library is called the SAT browser. It does pronounce SAT, S-A-T, or SAT browser. And the problem with the SAT browser is it did not validate or authorize any source SMS that it received. So this vulnerability then could be exploited by text messages. And once a text message was sent with SAT browser commands in it, it then was allowed access to a subset of what are called SIM toolkit commands, which are on the mobile device. Um, we issued a very detailed report in this, an over 40-page technical report, which is free online from www.simjacker.com, which I recommend you to read. But we found when we analyzed this that this vulnerability was present on several hundred million SIM cards around the world. And we could see, and I'll show you examples, that it was actively exploited in at least three countries in Latin America. Um, we shared a, a CVD, a coordinated vulnerability disclosure within the mobile industry, uh, mid last year, we reported some information 2019 before giving more technical information in October 2019. That staggered approach was to give time for mobile operators to put in place defenses and to see if they were actually affected or not. And the key thing about Simjacker is it was, one, it was a huge increase in, in complexity. It was the first recorded spyware actually sent within an SMS. There has been some rumors and reports from um, leaks from the NSA of this type of capability, but this has never actually been seen before in real life. But as well as this, it was also a huge increase in capability and allowed one surveillance company in particular to do a lot more than what they have been doing in the past and possibly to achieve a lot more uh, results and to offer new services to, to their customers. So the flow of how this actually works. So in this particular case, a surveillance company to do a SIM tracker attack, they don't need SS7 access. They don't need to buy expensive equipment. They don't need to buy links. All they need is a mobile device. They send this mobile device. They are sorry. They take this mobile device and they just send, simply send a text message with a series of commands in it to their target. This text message is then forwarded onto the target and is received by the device. When the device receives that text message, it actually gives it to the SIM card within the device. And then the SIM card takes over. And this is where the term SIMjacker came from. The SIM card will then instruct the device to provide information. In this particular case, uh, cell ID, and this information is sent back to the SIM card. The SIM card also requests a bunch of other information as well, such as the type of device and more attributes. But once all this information is received, the SIM card will then instruct the device to send out a text message. In this case, then, the device will send this text message directly back to the surveillance company and their mobile handset. So there is a seven used in the fact that all S7, but there's no need for expensive access. There's no need to try to gain or try to avoid S7 firewalls or damage firewalls. They're simply using text messages here 
to initiate and do the attacks. So this is the location tracking part of the part of the command, but in fact the whole the whole sequence from start to finish is a whole location tracking um, phase. Again, if you want more information about this, I really encourage you to check out the paper on simjacker.com because it goes in far more detail about this. I've shown here, a, this is a method one, send from handset, extract to handset. The surveillance company use many different methods. Sometimes they extract it to an SS7 node. Sometimes they send from other types of links and use multiple methods to try to avoid defenses. But this is in its most basic shows you how they actually executed this attack. Again, toolbox of commands that the attacker actually use. Um, the great thing from the attacker's perspective here, their pro is they don't require any SS7 access. All they required is a phone number, the phone number of the target. Now the con also from their perspective is that they needed to have the destination, the victim's handset to have a SIM card with this browser on it. Your SIM cards, vast majority of European SIM cards, don't have this this library on their on their SIM card. Um, it was a certain percentage when we analyzed. It was several hundred million. That's a conservative number, but not every SIM card around the world has this um, vulnerable library on it. So that was a particular con that they have. And also sometimes, not often, but sometimes some operators put in place security around that. So the default deployment of this of the library was vulnerable, but sometimes some operators have made some changes to make it non-vulnerable. So this is a con from obviously from the operator, from the attacker's perspective, in that not every mobile device around the world had this library present. So if I'm to take my grid again and the deployment and the, sorry, the distribution of these attacks. If I can say that SS7 is distributed this way, and then diameter is distributed this way, one way of visualizing a SimJacker attack is very much in the bottom left quadrant because the possibility for it to be blocked was actually quite low. It requires specific logic and algorithms which most operators may not have had in place. And the amount of information that it required was very, very low. Again, all it required is a phone number. That asterisk is, of course, though, on the presumption that the targeted number had a SIM card which had a SAP browser present on it. So if there was no SAP browser present in the target SIM, then it wouldn't be valid. So now I'm going to go into details about a particular attack. Uh, just one note before going to examples in this one, the vast majority of SimJacker attacks, which we saw, were sent from a handset to another handset. As in, I would target, an attacker would target you, and once your phone registered it, it would send it back to a handset, which would be um, normally within that network. But sometimes what we saw is that they would try to extract via a SS7 address. And this is the case I'm showing here. But essentially, this is a, an attack we saw a few months ago. Um, the destination is a Mexican phone, num phone number. It is coming. The message has been sent from a Mexican mobile as well. So this is a mobile to a mobile, or handset to a handset type of attack. And here we can see the actual payload. The SDK protocol indicates this is the SAP browser payload. And within it, it's requesting a series of information. To one that I've highlighted here is requesting location information, but it's also requesting IMEI information, which is the exact type of the actual handset. Once all this information is received, there's a concatenate command you see there, and that means it all puts it into a blob, and then this blob is sent outwards. And it is sent outwards using the send short message command. So this command instructs the handset to send out another text message with all the information which has been received. And this information will be sent to a SS7 address, which is, again, is registered in sure currency. And for those keeping track, that's actually the same SS7 address, as we call it a global title, as the attack which I showed in the SS7 example. And this type of information is quite useful for us sometimes to do correlation and 
association of different types of attacks. You can probably see this looks quite complex and it's a certainly a more sophisticated type of attack than what we see over S7 or even diameter. And a lot of work and a lot of effort has gone into putting together these types of attacks. But what it does do is it really opens up the the avenues for the attacker, because like I said, they don't need SS7 access for this. In my particular case, once we um, reverse engineered these types of attacks, it was quite a, a sobering concept to realize that I was able to, I had the ability myself to track potentially several hundred million people using text messages just by, just by using text messages. And this is before these mobile operators put in place detection and blocking of these attacks. So it's certainly a very, very powerful technique. So stepping back a moment and going back to, to generalities, I've shown you the SimJacker type of attack. Well, we ask ourselves, how does SimJacker rate to SS7? So this is data from the end of 2019 and the start of 2020, the second half of 2019, the start of 2020, and it's from specific operators, um, between eight to 10 mobile operators we've taken data from. And these, by the way, are all attacks which have been blocked. But we can see that the vast majority of attacks we've seen have been using SS7, roughly two thirds, and then one third of surveillance types of tracking attacks we've seen using SimJacker type techniques. Now, like I said, according to our intelligence, only one surveillance company uses SimJacker. But the, but the reason why the SimJacker volumes is actually so high is that we have one or two specific operators where the volumes are huge, where the volumes of SimJacker attacks are huge. And these are skewing somewhat our overall statistics. To show you this, if we were to show you the stats from one particular operator, or I call it operator A, in that particular case, the vast, vast majority of at location tracking attacks, which we see, have been executed using SimJacker, which is SMS. And only a small percentage, 15%, has been executed using SS7. And believe it or not, this is much smaller number of SimJacker attacks now than it was in the past. Prior to public announcement and prior to us putting in place active detection and blocking of these attacks, the ratio was much, much higher, many, many times higher, in that the volumes of location tracking attacks using SimJacker were absolutely enormous, was many, many times higher. Uh, the diameter attacks um, might be surprising, but we see quite a small, very small percentage up until the last six months of diameter attacks. Um, but somewhat surprising to me and possibly a shape of things to come. In the last six months, been a large escalation of diameter attacks. And I haven't shown diameter attacks in these stats, but in future reports, we can show them. So coming back to the SimJacker versus SS7 distribution, we, and I'll show you why, a working theory that we have behind this um, obviously mismatch between certain, oper certain operators is that they're different. We believe that there's different end users there are different types of end users for these surveillance companies. And this can be best probably shown with the following graph. So we're all aware, unfortunately, due to COVID, of, of rates per 100,000. So to build on this, what I've done here is to try to show a distribution of location tracking attempts per 100,000 subscribers in, in one year. So this is a way to show at an easy reference the rate of tracking per operator, because some operators are much bigger than others. And as a result, if we show the exact volumes, the actual numbers become very skewed. But you can actually see here, it's actually quite um, standard. I've shown nine operators here, and the SS7 location tracking activity normally ranges between 150 to maybe 50 um, location tracking attempts per 100,000 subscribers. So this seems quite standard, and this seems like uh, quite well or quite evenly distributed. But the interesting thing, if I start to add in SimJacker activity, we see in one particular operator that the amount of observed SimJacker location tracking is huge. It brings it up to roughly about 400 times. And this is actually with us doing this detecting and blocking. So when we go and detect and block these attacks, we actually disturb the system. It's not like Schrodinger's cat, but it's basically our act of observing and blocking this has caused the system to go out of equilibrium. 
We believe from our estimates from analysis prior to us doing this, this detection and blocking that this was the extent of the SimJacker type activity, up to over 1,200 location tracking attempts or 100,000 subscribers. Um, we've less regular evidence, but something we're trying to firm up. In fact, we believe another operator, it was actually even higher, it was even up to around 2,000 or possibly 2,000 and above location tracking attempts for 100,000 subscribers. So we can see that the actual usage of it was much, much higher in these operators, in this bigger operator. And the reason why we think, and what this gives us a few conclusions, is that we could say, at least from what we've observed, is that SS7, the 3G, 2G, 3G protocol, is not normally used for bulk su su subscriber tracking, at least by surveillance companies. But certainly SimJacker was or is. It was a technology which was developed and used to bulk tracking of subscribers. And this was one key reason as to why we found SimJacker, why we thought SimJacker was so important in that it really introduced a new way for surveillance companies to, um, and new use cases for them to potentially offer. So something that we also see other trends over time, this is probably also interesting for some, these are the trends of S7 location tracking commands over time. So we can see in 2016, ATI, which if you can remember, is the blue color. That's the one that we said that is probably the easiest one for the surveillance companies, but it's also the easier one for mobile operators to block. So the volumes of that have decreased a lot from 2016. And then other commands, the PSL, which is sort of midway, that had a, a growth in popularity between 2016 and 2017, and now it's really drowned off to around 2019. PSI, on the other hand, has increased and has been quite as steady. And that is the one that is hardest for the for the attacker to use. They would certainly prefer not to use it because it, it doesn't always work. But it's the one which the only one which they may have any success with anymore, or they feel they have any success. Like I said, these are all blocked commands. One interesting point is you may see two new um, colors here. Um, this is one called ATI uh, and provide PSI. And you may say, this is the exact same command. Well, what actually is happening here is that the attackers have done a variant. They've tried to basically disguise these commands. They're trying to give these commands a new lease of life. And they're using a, uh, a new sort of uh, potential vulnerability called global opcode. Um, if you want more information on this, I also recommend you check out this presentation from Positive Technologies from Hack in the Box in May 2019. But essentially what the attackers do is that they try to bypass protection in place. And if, they, if this works, this gives them a new lease of life in the ATI command, because then they come back to using their favorite ATI command. And this time, you may try to be able to bypass any defenses that are in place. So one question I we often get asked is, how do these surveillance companies gain access to the SS7 network? Sometimes that is closely followed by, and how do I gain access to the SS7 network? Oh, which is I being the person who is asking me this question. So there's multiple methods, and a lot of this comes down to intelligence and, and research, but primarily there's three main methods which are the most common. And one, as you can guess, is that they pay for the link. And this can be quite nebulous and very hard sometimes to track down, but often they will have a, they will set up, these friends companies might set up a front company who then negotiate access to other companies who may resell access to mobile operators. So there might be multiple links here, uh, multiple layers of who's selling access to whom. This is still not guaranteed to work for them, um, but it often works best for them in, in jurisdictions or areas which may have poor regulations or oversight or, or um, companies who may not investigate too thoroughly what these companies are doing once they get access. In many cases, they may get access to use for one technique or for legitimate services, and then after a month or two, start to switch to use other services which are malicious. The second method which they may use to gain access is to use Big Brother. Um, governments, like I said, are the customers of these surveillance solutions. So what they may man do is they mandate the system might be installed in the captive operator um, or else add directly onto the link, bypassing the operator completely. 
In this case, then the operator may have has very little say in the matter. They've been told they installed a system. Or in some a lot of countries around the world, the operators might have direct connections to the to the backbone network and they can add directly onto the link. This is less common than paying for the link method, but it can actually happen. And finally, something that's quite rare nowadays at least is old legacy connections, default companies whose access is not completely removed. This is much rarer because on the SS7 network, every, every packet has to be paid by somebody. So it's very unusual to have access to a network and nobody's charging you for it. Uh, it's also less of an issue in diameter than SS7, but it was present in the past and it happened. There was also less common ways that operators may already surveillance companies may get access, but I'm not going to go into detail in this presentation. One particular thing though is quite quite interesting is that first of all, as you can guess, the pricing of the access is not very opaque. But from our analysis, we can see that normally between it costs between two to ten cent per message message signal unit that are sent. But it's very much that the more connections, the more access that that a surveillance company has over the SS7 diameter network, the much more valuable it is because this means if some of these get blocked or get detected, it still has backups, still have different ways to send attacks. So it's very much in these surveillance companies' interest to have as many, as much access as possible, as distributed as possible. This also leads to some rather bizarre business cases when you come across these. This here is a graph uh, from an SS7 tracking company uh, or a purported SS7 tracking company and the prices that they advertised on the web. And this is really much the opposite of what you would expect for an, uh, if you were an economics student because there was no economies of scale here. They were actually charging more the more you tried to track and not less, which is quite unusual. But then it makes sense if you consider what they're doing. The more that you try to track, the more that you will be drawing attention to yourself, and therefore the more likely that the link will be disconnected and they will lose their entire business. So from their perspective, it's worth more to charge you more because they are taking higher and higher risk and not charge you less even though you're using up, uh, you're, you're actually paying for more. So it's a sort of an inverse of what you expect. And like I said, not really economies of scale type approach. So this is surveillance companies today, but also we want to talk about 5G and mobile surveillance companies. Now, I can guarantee you that 5G networks will be targeted for use by these mobile surveillance companies. And again, like I said at the start, you know, age is a number, and in this case, newer does not always equal better. The 5G network does solve many security problems on, on mobile networks, especially on the radio side and does make improvements on some of the core network side, but it also introduces new risks and new and new potential problems. Well, for a start, it's, it's more complex. And anything that's more complex inevitably may have more potential vulnerabilities. And to show you how much more complex, here's a graph of the 4G network um, versus the 5G network when it comes to protocol complexity. And you can see it's many multiples of times more complex both on the number of messages which could be sent, that's on the bottom axis, and within those messages, how many different elements. And if you consider each one of those elements may have to be individually inspected and checked, this can make things much more complex when it comes to trying to defend these networks. As well as that, the 5G networks have new concepts like slicing, uh, mixed networks, 5G networks talking to 4G networks, talking to 3G networks. So there's a lot of moving parts which could mean, which will mean, and are areas that mobile surveillance companies will try to exploit. So one good thing, uh, at least this time, is that unlike 3G and 4G, within the industry, we are now defining security from the start for the 5G networks. It's always much easier to put in place security from the start than try to reverse engineer in security. But one key thing we have to keep, in, keep in mind, there's a difference between IT and mobile network security. We already know in 3G and 4G that the vast majority of attacks come from known legitimate entities. They come in from the SS7 network. So unlike possibly IT where you can just block off um, certain um, IP addresses or sources, 
there's no way one operator can block off another continent or often another country. So you do have to accept that you are going to be targeted and attacked. And so you need to put into place defenses to detect within those flows what's going on. And for a good discussion about this and why 5G in itself won't solve a lot of those issues, please see this blog I wrote within the GSMA, which covered um, the issuance of a new document, a new series of recommendations within the GSMA on 5G internet security. So finally, the toolbox on 5G starts to get very, very complicated for commands here. I won't go into too much details. Again, there's going to be pros and cons for the attacker. Unfortunately, as when as well, they also get multiple new ways to get location. They can sign up for events and subscriptions. So it's going to get quite complex and there's going to be a lot of work required to detect and block these attacks and try to stop these surveillance companies. Again, with this grid of my previous attacks, 3G, um, 2G, 3G, 4G, and SimJacker, if I add in the 5G commands, things get quite, get quite complicated, but these are my estimations of the distribution of these. Some of these commands are quite interesting, especially GMLC underscore PL, but time will tell if these distributions are correct and how often or what the attackers will try to use them and how, when they will try to use them. So I've covered a huge amount of information here in this presentation and thank you, we've come to the end of it. But there's a few key takeaways I want you to take and some key conclusions that we could take from this presentation. As you can guess, and as I've shown you, surveillance companies, they do exploit mobile signal networks today, um, but they're not static. They adjust techniques based on defenses and end users. Um, if you start to read articles about S7, it can be wide open. That is not the case for the vast majority of operators. Operators are doing things. Um, it's also at the same time, the surveillance companies are also making changes as well to also avoid these defenses that are put in place. Another key point in 5G networks is that they are not invulnerable. Um, if somebody says that 5G networks is fully secure, then that is not true. There will be opportunities for surveillance companies and they will definitely try to use it. Because like I said, surveillance companies don't care about the technology path. They care about the, well, they don't care about the target, but they care about getting information about the target and they will use whatever technologies that they can. And again, mobile operators, they can and, and many do detect and block attacks. And the key to do this is intelligence. And from our, from our perspective, the key thing is that like many types of security, you can't just press a button and, and walk away from it. You have to actually look after it, intel look, use your intelligence, investigate, because these surveillance companies have huge resources and they will make efforts to bypass and go around any type of defenses that you have in place. And then it comes back to the team of this presentation. You know, why are we doing this analysis? Well, the reason we do this type of analysis is because if you cannot see what is going on, you cannot conceivably stop it in the future. So watching the watchers, as well as being interesting, is also critical from a security perspective, because the more you know about what they are doing, the better you are able to detect them and block them. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation. I've only scratched the surface of surveillance companies and their use of mobile networks, but I hope you found this information useful and I look forward to taking your questions now. Yeah, welcome back from uh, this presentation so far. Um, large thanks um, uh, to uh, Karhal here for uh, this talk. And there are already like lots of questions uh, which came in for you. The first best thing about is what a great talk, a lot of information and very well presented. We have to thank you for that. And um, there are a couple of questions still on it. Um, is there a list of these surveillance companies available? Uh, thanks very much for that. Um, excellent question. It's a good question. I want to. I'd, I'd like to know the answer myself. I, I could really use that list. Um, so to be more serious, um, there's some journalists who've done some research on this, and a lot of them have, have done some put up some lists about there. There is no definitive list. I mean, everybody knows probably the more 
the, the names that you've heard about, such as uh, NSO or Circles. Circles is the division of, of, of NSO, which does this. There's other companies like Rayzone, uh, Verint, the companies like that. Um, so but there's no definitive list, although journalists have looked at this. One, one thing to keep in mind, though, about the, these companies is a lot of them, we found, I think, some of them actually might uh, resell each other or work with each other. So it's often quite difficult to say that's one particular company, it was different company. Sometimes they do have a bit of a um, coordination or relationship with each other. But um, there's been some good articles on, on Forbes on this, um, some articles recently in The Guardian, and some some other information which is out there, which is probably the closest basis we all any of us have to any kind of list. And uh, do any companies sell historical geolocation data coupled to mobile phone numbers? Um, I don't. I, these surveillance companies, per se, I don't. I don't think that's the business that they're in. They're more fulfilling a, a request response type of of um, business. Selling historical information is is probably not what these surveillance companies try to do. Um, 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 we've all read about, heard about these other companies, though, which are building up information on on subscribers, maybe taking it for apps and so on. So possibly they may sell it, but these surveillance companies don't think that that is the business they're in. They're more into fulfilling direct requests from the, from their customers at the time. So uh, how long is the information gathered during the information fa uh, gathering phase um, useful for the attacker? Will it outdate when the victim changes the mobile cell, or is it constrained by time somehow? Uh, that's a good question. So in the information gathering phase, what they're trying to do is gain things like what's the what's the IMSI per perdemison? And that really doesn't change too much. However, then they need to know uh, what rough area the subscriber is registered at. That could be the MSC or the MME in diameter. That information can change, but not too much. Um, so it, it does have a lifespan of possibly a few hours, days. Um, at least part of party information of a lifespan of that. And the MZU information might last for longer. But the information gathering phase is not just for for use for direct location tracking. Sometimes they also use to see if this number actually exists. Sometimes surveillance companies, they're not fully aware. Uh, if, if, a, if a surveillance company is trying to track somebody, they may only have partial digits of the number. They don't actually have the full number. So they're trying to see, well, they know the first eight digits are this, and then they try to cycle through all the different digits to see what numbers actually exist. So from, from that perspective, if they do this sort of attack, then they can then figure out if those numbers exist or not. Then also that information has a, a fairly long fairly long lifespan. So do they only want to get information on the target or do they things like psychological warfare, lawfare, trauma-based, mind control as well? Uh, mind control would be a bit difficult, but... Um, it possible. <laughs> um, the vast majority of showed one the graphs, the vast majority of activity that they do is is location tracking. Um, it's their so it's their it's their bread and butter. It's the main thing that they try to do, and the information harvesting part of it is is often directly related to it. But there is a certain percentage of time that they do other activities, such as we we have seen um, attempted um, interception of phone calls or text messages, but that doesn't seem to be their primary goal in doing this. So you, you could conceivably do, if you did interception of text messages or phone calls, you know, get that information, but it's it doesn't seem to be their primary function in what they're doing. The primary function is to try to track the locations of people. And I imagine from their customer's perspective, that's what they need to know or want to know most of the time. And then if they do want to get more information, they don't just rely on SO7 or diameter. They, could, they may have other methods to try to get information from the handset or who's talking to whom. But for location tracking, this is probably their main niche that they see using these technologies for. And that is probably, they think it's one of the better ways of doing it because it's sort of independent of operating system or, or location in the world. All right. As you said, uh, location tracking. We have here another uh, question. Um, can the SIM jacker also be use, uh, used to locate a lost or stolen cell phones or other SIM using devices like a lot of cars up to this times or the new bikes? And is there a restriction in the distance? Um, that's a good question. So, like I said, the SIM jacker attack depended on a specific library being present on the actual SIM card. That library isn't present in the, the vast majority of the world's operators. It's mostly in um, again, there's a map in that report, but basically South, Central, and parts of North America, and then parts of Europe and Asia. So let's say you were in a country that did have the, the library distributed. 
Um, you you can, it's not just cell ID, we did cover in report, you can actually request a slightly differential cell ID, you can get a sort of better location, it wouldn't be exactly the same as GPS, but it will be rare, reasonably accurate. However, you know, th this is the problem with, with SimJacker is that, you know, who's to say that you're tracking your own bike or your own car? I mean, you could be tracking somebody else's bike or somebody else's car and at that point then you're, you're doing location tracking. So, so it's, it's something then, yeah, I, I don't know if they, what the long term that they plan to do with these libraries in these countries, a lot of them are trying to they put in place security. So now they can't actually detect or nobody can send these messages anymore. But so it will be an option, but it's, it's location tracking as a service wouldn't be something I'd be too happy with to see being sold commercially. Mm -hmm. um, is there a way to check if my SIM card is vulnerable to a SIM checker? Yes, there is. Um, the good folks in, in SR Labs, they actually uh, updated and released a, an application called Sim Tester. That's uh, free and it's uh, it's open source. You can download that and you can check that against your, your SIM card. And that will tell you what type of um, SIM card applications are on the device and what's their security settings. From that, you'll be able to sell then if, if they received a text message, release, whether it would actually run against it or not. I'm back. The question was, by using the SIM jacker attack with STK command, is it possible to extract keys contained on the SIM card? So the individual subscriber authentication key? Welcome back. Um, it, it's No, it's, it's not possible via that method because that isn't... You, you don't actually have access to the SIM. You only have access to a subset of, of SDK commands. And that's actually the that's actually kind of related to a previous unrelated vulnerability, which was discovered in SIM cards. Um, one person I mentioned, again, Carson Null, he did some research in 2013, and he was able to get access by sending textures to get access to the SIM, the actual key to the SIM card. And when you have this access SIM to that key, you're able to access all the SDK commands. So the good thing about the SimJacker attack is you didn't actually need the SIM key to get access to the, to a subset of commands, but via the via the SimJacker you wouldn't actually have access to that key. Although I say that, um, in doing some of our attacks and doing some of our testing, we were actually able to potentially exceed the boundary of the the sandbox for the for the uh, SAP browser library. Because we were able to brick the, the phone on different or brick the SIM card on different occasions, so there was some a bit of leakiness. So it's highly, highly unlikely you get access, but if perhaps with a proprietary SIM card, an old proprietary SIM card, it may be possible to somehow uh, escape the, the sandbox further and try to get access. But I, I highly doubt it. So let's uh, see if we go from here. Um, what uh, data is or which data are uh, the sources for your plots? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, that's the plots is really from from our experience. It's it's not too empiric. Um, the, um, the vertical axis is really about the amount of information that's required, and the the bottom axis is really from our experience and you know, really work with operators to see how easy it is, and, and from their perspective to detect and block these. So it's more of a, just a, a rough guide. It's it, it's based on our experience and what we see, it's more a way just to easily visualize the type of attacks, the choices that operators have, or sorry, the choices that attackers have when they go to do these types of attacks. And then, and then because you can see an evolution over time, the attackers, they, they much, much prefer to do the simplest thing. And they often have access to a person's phone number far easier than have access to an IMSI and their, their serving cell address or the serving MSC address. So they would much rather prefer to do those types of attacks all the time. So we've only forced them to do other types of attacks because of pressure. And But if they get a chance to go back to original attacks, which I showed when they use a sort of global opcode variant, they will go back to it if they can. Um, but not every operator moves at the same speed. Not every operator has the same levels of protection. And so as a result, then they've got different choices, different places. But that source comes from, from our experience. Um, previously, it had, been, it had been suggested that it's uh, easy to find unsecure SS7 endpoints on the internet. Is this uh, not a source of connectivity anymore? It's very much, much rarer now than it has been in the past. Uh, they, they probably never say never. They probably do exist. Um, they, to get access nowadays, like I said, it's those three options. A lot of it does come down to, to paying to, for access because... Like I said, you, it's a, it's a money-based system. Um, and anybody involved in transporting any type of sizable communication, any sort of sizable interconnect traffic is going to try to charge you for it. So you, it's, 
getting access is the easiest way from there, from those for surveillance companies' perspective, and the most regular way, which is also important, is is normally try to pay for it. And what they try to do is they set up, a, like I said, some sort of front company, or they partner via a different company, and then they work with a company who does something like IoT type services or SMS type services. They do something legitimate for a month or two, and then they might start to do other types of traffic. So just finding a unsecured link, um, it's it's quite quite rare these days. Um, how is it possible not only to identify the types of attacks, but actually also the actual entities or surveillance companies? Uh, with a lot of work, um, we work with our with our customers. So a lot of research. That's that's a very good question. How do you know the intent behind it, and how do you then put a name to that, to that source? It doesn't come easy, but a lot of work. Um, I mean, they, we have our intelligence, they have their intelligence, like I talked to you earlier, it's very likely someone were on this call and watching this presentation, but um, we, we look at the type of people, we, we, are, we, we talk with our customers, they look at some of the, the sources of information, uh, we try to talk back to original sources, we try to talk back to original where, where they come from, and then they try to see who they, who they sold access to. Sometimes this information is, is forthcoming, sometimes it isn't. And doing that, then we can sort of put together a sort of a framework of what type of companies may have originally been granted access and then who they work with. So it's a bit of forensics and then trying to figure out, I mean, who's talking to whom, like I said, some surveillance companies resell access to each other. Like things get really confusing then at that stage, but it's it's with a lot of work. So we don't, it's not something we do lightly and then it can take, take quite a bit of time to, to pin down and especially as they change, but that's, it's it's just with, with research and intelligence. Um, and uh, do you notify people you found uh, are being tracked? We don't notify people. Um, obviously, we notify our customers for the mobile operators. Then they may go ahead and notify people. Um, and that takes me to another point as well. As also, sometimes the sources as well, where these attacks are coming from, notifying them is sometimes a, a really unusual experience. Sometimes you get an answer. Sometimes you don't get an answer. In many cases, like I said, some of these operators may not be aware of this. Um, and uh, that can cause uh, some unusual conversations if, if attack the activities come from the network we're not aware of. And sometimes they may be aware of it and just not able to do anything about it. But from the people who've been tracked side, we would notify our operators our, who are our customers. Um, and, and then they would take that forward whether they would actually do anything about it. Like I said, in many of these cases, uh, these are attacks that we're actually blocking. So the information hasn't been retrieved. The person hasn't, location hasn't been tracked. So in that particular situation, then they'll make a decision themselves about, about what to do next. All right. So is there anything uh, that can be done to protect oneself from uh, this surveillance? Um, uh, I mean, could I just use my, my old cell phone rather than a smartphone? Or um, is there anything else I can do except for um, the app you said for, for the SIM card checking? Um, unfortunately, on the mobile network side, not, not really. Um, you can decide not to use text messages or phone calls, but it doesn't make a difference. Um, you still have to register in the mobile network at some stage that data has been recorded, and this is what the, the surveillance companies are targeting. Um, and that, that's somewhat that's some of the more frustrating things. I mean, the, the most best thing you could do possibly ask your operator, <clears throat> sorry, um, do they have protection in place? Are they looking for this? This this also can get a bit confusing though as well because it's when. Uh, something I would have covered about more time. When mobile operators make a decision on protecting their network, most operators around the world are protecting their network. At least they're protecting their own subscribers. Things get more complicated then when it comes to possibly roaming subscribers. So you could roam from Germany to America or Russia or somewhere like that. And those operators there, then they have a decision to make whether they have to protect this person who came in, particularly because they don't have all the information about your network. And they may think that, Oh, he's come from Germany, and now there's a message coming in from Italy, and maybe they have some sort of arrangement with each other. And so every operator around the world may not notice. And so this is why it, it, it like most things in life, it's quite gray when you see a report of this this person has been attacked over SS7. Well, that that may not be a case that the mobile operator is trying to protect. It's definitely trying to protect its own subscribers, but it may not be able to try to protect, or, or may not have all the information to protect others. And in fact, some of that activity may actually be legitimate. And to block it could actually cause serious problems with it with subscribers roaming into their network. So I'll come back to your original question. No, there's not too much you can do. Personally, this information is stored, but it's, the main thing is to to ask your mobile operator what are they doing and what type of protection they have in place. 
And uh, do does the SMS exchange show up on the monthly bill from the operator? So um, can I can I um, see by the bill that uh, these SMS have gone back and forth? On the SIM jacker attack, um, well, first of all, very few people actually check their monthly bills for for SMS anymore. Um, in that particular case, they actually had a variant, which is the one I showed on on the Wireshark, that they actually tried to send it out the message that is sent outwards via this um, global title, this SS7 node that was in uh, the Channel Islands. And because that wouldn't be acknowledged successfully, it wouldn't actually show up in your billing records. So that's, we believe, one of the reasons that it was that there would be no possibility that that would show up in your billing records. The vast majority of networks nowadays don't have any billing for reception of text messages. So those receiving messages will not show up any bills. Yes, if you send out a message um, in those places, that was in Mexico, for example, it may show up, but um that again most people have all you eat bills all, all you can eat type bills they're not even going to see this all right so that will be the last question for now um i don't see any other message uh, incoming so thanks for our signal angel vanny she did a great job in sorting the questions and providing me here with a real good um support uh thank you uh, back on all the people from the video operation and uh, of course, thank you um, for this really interesting talk. I had a really um, interesting um, hour here together with you. So, Cahal, let me thank you also on my behalf. And uh, I hope to see you again um, Thanks very much. on uh, this topic. And uh, I think there are still more to come. Thanks very much. Thanks for letting me speak.